We are starting in a second. And good morning, everyone. This is a, a day three of our uh, international workshop, Open Data Science Europe. And uh, today we have a lot of uh, exciting talks and there's going to be also a award session and discussion panel. So please join us uh, for the other talks also. Uh, we kick off with a, a presentation by Sarah Chisbro. Uh, she's a remote sensing uh, specialist um, at the um, um, catapult um, in the UK. And she, uh, she did a PhD on remote sensing um, and she's, she's been developing some methods, I think, which are very compatible to our project and to the project, the uh, um, Geoharmonizer and Open Data Science. And with this thing, I would just like to pass the floor to Sarah and thank her for her time. And uh, we look forward to your talk. Please, Sarah, take over. Thank you very much for the, for the introduction, Tommy. Um, and slight promotion as well. Um, I haven't actually done a, done a PhD um, yet anyway. Um, I have a, a, a master's in, in Earth Observation and Geoinformation Management. Um, and yes, as, as mentioned, I work at an organization called um, Satellite Applications Catapult. Um, we're based, based in the UK. Um, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about, about the organization um, in just a minute. Um, so yeah, I've got a, a geography background with kind of a, a master's in, in Earth observation or um, as it's named um, elsewhere, remote sensing. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about an, an implementation of, of the Open Data Cube. Um, it, it's a core technology that's um, enabled the creation of multiple um, Earth observation data cubes around the world. Um, several of the others are, of which are seem to be presented in, in this conference, which is, is fantastic. Um, this, this talk will discuss the ongoing implementation of the IPP Common Sensing Data Cube, um, which is located over the South Pacific region, um, focusing on, on small island nations um, such as, as Fiji, Vanuatu and Solomon, Solomon Islands. Um, this project has been funded by, by the UK Space Agency's International Partnership Programme um, and the key technologies used as well as, as realities of developing a data cube from the spec perspective of an EO data scientist um, will be presented. Um, so, so who we are as, as an organisation, Satellite Applications Catapult, um, we're quite a, a unique um, business. Um, we're an, an innovation and technology company and we're trying to, to transform the way the world uses satellite technology and data. Um, we're, we're partially backed by, by UK government um, and, and the UK Space Agency. Um, we're, we're an independent organisation, not related to government, um, but we're there to kind of bring together industry researchers and end, end users um, and help organisations, particularly within the UK, grow their businesses within, within the space industry. Um, and our focus um, is across across several areas. We have kind of those um, connectivity type satellites, um, but but the area in which I work within the organisation is within geospatial intelligence, um, and we're there to sort of energise the market, empower technology, and en enable businesses throughout this this Earth observation and, and geospatial sector. Um, application wise, we have multiple vertical value streams um, from, from agriculture, transport, um, health, sustainable development, and, and they're continually growing as well with sort of recently branching out into more sustainable finance type objectives. Um, so, so the project itself of which the data cube is, is kind of part of a, a larger solution. Um, so the overall kind of vision or, or aim of common sensing is to improve national resilience towards climate change, um, including disaster risk reduction and food production, um, and contribute to sustainable development in Fiji, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu with support of information derived from, from satellites. Um, for Pacific Island nations um, to respond to, prepare for and anticipate hazardous events and disturbances related to the climate known as climate resilience um, is increasingly vital. Um, we've been taking a, a user-centered design approach where our kind of designers have, have been talking to many of those, those in countries and gathering requirements. Um, the, the project has developed a platform to insist to assist government level ministers in making decisions around climate resilience of which the data cube is, is a part of the solution. Um, so with building um, the, the sort of these, these four areas of focus, um, one is to, to build climate resilience, 
point, you need detailed understanding of, of future climate conditions as well as, as, well as past um, in both a, a sort of timely and scalable manner. Um, next is kind of to, to build um, climate resilient food systems, which needs detailed understanding of, of future climate and their impact on food sources as well as um, building disaster resilient communities under um, changing climate requires a detailed understanding of both current and future risk and vulnerabilities. Um, so to, to build climate resilience um, requires a level of resource and investment which is often beyond the capacity of, of individual countries. So therefore having access to um, international climate finance funds is, is crucial and hopefully what, what um, the platform being developed here can, can help support with. Um, so yeah, it's important to sort of sort of note at this point that the end users of this project are government ministries um, and climate finance advisors um, with, within these these the countries um, of which we have the data over. Um, we have fantastic in country representatives within those governments um, who are providing feedback and support as, as this project has been been developed right from the start. Um, so kind of the the overall goals are to to develop satellite based information services um, which directly match the challenges and the needs for, for each of these countries um, to strengthen each country's capacity to improve their climate resilience and disaster risk management. Um, so this includes us doing kind of two things. Um, the project focuses on, on delivering geospatial and climate information and decision making tools um, and capacity building for, for technical experts, sector specialists and decision makers. Um, also place specialists within government structures to ensure local knowledge and data systems benefit from the added capabilities afforded by the, by the common sensing project. Um, so, so we're working as, as one sort of organisation within um, a much larger consortium um, and these are kind of our, our prime partners. Um, so um, some of some of them are, are providing kind of data services. Um, others are, are providing sort of um, training type training and capacity building um, sort of understanding and knowledge. Whilst others such as such as uh, DevEx is providing more of that kind of marketing support. Um, so the main kind of kind of data providers here are um, ourselves with with the the Data Cube solution based off, off the open data queue technologies. Uh, the University of Portsmouth are providing expertise on, on um, products such as bathymetry and um, landslide risk. The Met Office, um, so this, this is the, the UK's Met Office, are providing data on um, climate sort of going back 30 years as well as, as, well as predictions. Um, spatial days are, are providing um, geospatial um, sort of technical support um, and Sensonomic are, are providing data on food systems, um, as well as, as UNISAP providing kind of a, a disaster resilience app. Um, so yeah, all of this is, is provided by this UK Space Agency International Partnership Programme um, funding. Okay, so um, now I'll, I'll sort of move on to what, what many of you on, on this call are, are here for. Um, the, the technology um, which we have both produced as well as um, the technologies that, that we've used to sort of help produce this, this solution. Um, as those of you who are familiar with, with these logos, um, most of these are open source, um, which has been absolutely essential to the development of, of this project and kind of the, the communities around this, um, the communities which have also developed around many of these, these softwares are also really important, important kind of resource, um, particularly kind of the Open Data Cube community. Um, this list is, is by no means exhaustive, um, but some of the really important tools which have enabled us to, to develop our solutions are, are here, and I hope I'll put some of those into, into coming up. Um, so I think it's important to kind of highlight this point that I'm an Earth observation scientist. I like working with, with satellite imagery. Um, I've been working on, on this project in conjunction with, with many others within the wider, wider consortium, um, but also within the Catapult for several years. We've had a team of developers, GIS specialists and, and EO data scientists, as well as the designers and all the others um, who are required to kind of ensure a technical project runs smoothly. Um, although many partners have um, sort of, yeah, also 
contributed to this project um the catapult's been responsible for kind of bringing together this um this wider picture and, and kind of portal um so as you sort of saw on the slide before we kind of have have um an esri sort of client side um the the reason for this is is the um government ministries within one of our countries um fiji already use um, sort of an ESRI enterprise system and, and wanted that to be integrated with, with their existing systems. Um, whereas Solomon Islands and, and Vanuatu don't, don't have that system already set up, so they're using an open source um, system based on Ontario GIS. Um, so sort of here in, in the top right of this kind of architecture diagram, we've got these these other data services which, which are coming in, um, particularly this, this UNITAR disaster um, support app um and it's important to note now these these data centers um so cu currently this this system is is based out of out of the uk this data system um within catapult um we have a a, a data store called called sems um which was which is currently currently hosting um the data but we're we're in the process now of of, of moving that out to the to the south pacific region um the university of the south pacific which is based within fiji um have sort of taken on responsibility to host this which is is fantastic from a sustainability point of view of the project um because it it means that it's 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 not being sort of held within within the UK um, and will sort of be, be dropped when when this funding is up. Um, it's been taken on by University of South Pacific and they're sort of taking on responsibility for maintaining it, um, as well as sort of their, their students being able to, to use this data cube system also. Um, and they obviously have, have close relationships with with the sort of the government ministries who who are the end users um and then sort of this yeah itc data center here which is is um the fiji's existing esri um structure um so here is kind of that this, this sort of box down here is is what we've sort of really been responsible for bringing together which are these applications um i assume that you can see my pointer um I'll keep going. Um, so then the, this box in the bottom right, so I've sort of put together a, a slightly messy diagram of, of how this looks with with kind of the, the technologies that we're talking about. So this is what I would I would call our data cube processing chain, um, where we're going from um, sort of having this um, wealth of satellite imagery, um, mostly sort of well originally the the sort of program was to have um sentinel one sentinel two from ESA. um well sort of the imagery the data from, from ESA downloaded from 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 various portals for for various reasons as well as as well as landsat um but we've actually sort of expanded beyond this um bringing in kind of modus data um there's also some some spot imagery in there as well um and more, more recently novasar which is um a new s-band SAR satellite um for those of you who who are sort of satellite more satellite -y experts um which is a kind of a, a uk operated satellite but we we've tasked some imagery of, over fiji um so what we've sort of developed is a system where it's um quite easy to, to sort of bring in any sort of satellite data um, as well as any other kind of geospatial data in, into this data cube. Um, so, so the first kind of step of, of the data cube is um, to, to create this this ARD, which um, as an, an Earth observation specialist, I can 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 say is is the majority of, of the legwork of, of using satellite data. Um, so so we sort of our ARD processing chains are, are in line with with kind of um, industry standards. Um, there's, there's a lot of work being done, particularly out of um, Australia, um, on kind of kind of these these standardizations. Um, and we've sort of integrated these with with technologies such as such as Stack, um, which um, enables kind of the in indexing of, of the data in, in a commonly known way. Um, it's all kind of dockerized and containerized um with within our um github all of these processing chains um and the outputs are um are cloud optimized geotiffs um so so all that's been been really interesting work and, and as i said kind of takes out a lot of a lot of the legwork along the way um and these these kind of open source technologies have been really integral to that i'm sure that, that these sort of most of the technologies within 
within these slides um, have, have been mentioned sort of sort of yesterday in talks as well, in talks as well as um, today and I imagine they, they all will be highlighted fairly heavily as well. Um, these sort of sort of three um, across across the top here are, are ones which have been used throughout the whole process. Um, so, so once we've got our, our ARD, which is, is analysis ready data, um, we've put that into, into an S3 like storage. Currently, this is hosted on, on SEMS, our kind of internal computing system, um, cloud computing system, um, but to be moved to, to the University of the South Pacific. Um, many of the other data cubes operate on on kind of AWS currently, um, including kind of the um, the African Data Cube and um, uh, sorry Digital Earth Africa and um, Digital Earth Australia. We began with this system being hosted on, on AWS, um, but made because of this kind of sustainability aspect and um, sort of conversations which which were which took us in the direction of, of, of hosting it elsewhere. We, we moved on to our own systems and then sort of yeah, made this connection with, with University of South Pacific. Um, so it, it's, it's an S3 like storage that we're using, but it's, it's not um, AWS S3. Um, and then we've got this, this product generation, which, which I'll go into a bit more in a minute. So this is sort of bringing in this, this really core cool technology of, of the Open Data Cube. Um, alongside sort of DASC for, for, um, for scaling the processing, um, enable us, enabling us to, to, to do processing um, at, across scales at sort of um, up to, to, to kind of countrywide analysis, um, which as a, as a kind of scientist was um, sort of a bit of a learning, learning curve for me, um, but this sort of product generation is, is happening within Jupyter Notebooks. Um, which I again will we'll go into a bit in a bit more detail um, quite soon. Um, and then we've got this kind of user access. So there's two ways that, that the users can kind of access this data. One is um, through Jupyter Notebooks directly, sort of um, talking, talking back to our, our um, S3 storage of, of, of ARD. Um, and that's kind of kind of taking advantage of this 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 stack indexing, um, in in the way that, that you access and the data. We'll have a look at a little a little bit of code, kind of kind of later on, um, but we, um, but yeah, if if you sort of looked into any of the other the other data cubes, um, we operate in a, in a very similar way. Um, so and the other way, apart from accessing it directly through through notebooks, is through um, in in Fiji, kind of using this um, Esri system, um, where we've developed kind of a, a portal along with with the apps provided by the other partners, such as the Climate App and the Disaster um, Resilience App, and then for for Solomon Islands and, and Vanuatu, it's a, a Terrier GIS based system or, or portal rather. So. Um, as kind of several several of the, the talks I've heard recently, which um, have built systems off off the Open Data Cube, um, from a, from a from a technical standpoint, our our Data Cube is, is an implementation of, of all of the the amazing work which has gone on with the Open Data Cube, um, particularly by by the likes of Geoscience Australia. Um, it's it's enabled us to sort of hit hit the ground running with. Um, with implementation um, and for, for those of you who kind of don't know the, the principles of, of an open data cube um, I'd certainly go, go and um, check out the open data cube, cube website the documentation is, is um, pretty readable um, and yeah I, I'd recommend going and have a look around there's some really nice examples um, but in principle it, it's kind of a way of taking, taking satellite imagery and um, stacking it up and then you can access it in a way of um, being able to take small chunks of data through through space and time um, and provide analysis on it sort of straight away, um, rather than having to, to download whole images um, is, is really beneficial. So um, here's just kind of kind of an overview of what, what kind of data is within our data cube. Um, as I've said, we've sort of um, this is sort of what what the project, what, what we initially said we'd, we'd do on this project, um, which was to, to bring in Sentinel one, Sentinel two, two, and um, the Landsat archive. Um, we, we've ha we have added some more data sets um, as well, which is is really exciting, um, and and they will be accessible by kind of the users, especially when when it's once it's handed over. Um, 
when sort of the data cube was well sorry when this project was set up we we're sort of saying oh look we can go back to 30 years worth of, worth of landsat data as you kind of do um but the the realities are that um landsat 4 and landsat 5 doesn't have great availability over, over the south pacific um as this is is um at, at this the, the Landsat series wasn't sort of always imaging. Um, it was being being turned off over, particularly over cloudy regions, which which the South Pacific is for many months of the year. Um, so so we have got some some quite large data gaps in this kind of time series going back, which is a shame for some some of the use cases that we have, um, and also the the sort of faults on board Landsat Seven. Um, which which have led to, to the stripe mapping, um, but when you sort of mosaic a lot of data sets together, that that does sort of sort of go away. Um, but from kind of Landsat Landsat eight onwards, um, there's a really fantastic kind of data sets in there. I should have actually put in the statistics of, of how many images that we we have loaded in and, and that kind of thing across across the South Pacific. Um, but it is a, a very impressive amount. Um, one thing I realise I haven't particularly covered yet is, is what sort of stage we are at in this project. Um, we're, we're coming very much to the end of it. Um, all, all of the data is, is loaded in and all of the products are there and available and we're currently kind of in a, a testing phase with um, some of those government um, sort of bodies who are going to be going to be using this this data cube um, as well as sort of um, at the point of trick doing trainings within University of the South Pacific as well um, to sort of ensure that, that this is a smooth handover of the system um, so so all, all of the data is data is there and done there's a couple of things with um, sort of integrating the data cube into Terrier GIS which our developers are, are still working on but again it's sort of very near the end of that process and the Fiji solution is is um, the Fiji Esri kind of solution is, is, is very much there is that's that was sort of our, our starting point so as well as this kind of these ARD products um, which we've we've sort of pre-processed pre we've also gone for some um, putting some some derived routine products into our data store um, so um, this is when when we've developed things at, at certain cadence um, and then then push them back in, into the SQL like store. Currently, kind of the the more on demand products, which is the ones that the users are making, don't get pushed back into into our um, S3 storage, um, but our routine products do. Um, so so routine ones are, are two main products. We've got got water masks, which um, have been developed for every sort of single scene across across all of the sensors. Um, many of the other data cubes have used kind of um, something called called WAFs, which is water observations from space. Um, but but we sort of found quite a few flaws with that, especially um, a, a, a sort of looking across sensors. Um, and also we wanted this kind of Sentinel one to be be a large part of this solution. So we went for a um, we, we went for producing watermax by machine learning techniques um, to give a two band raster, one of which is, is a binary mask um, and the other a, a kind of predicted confidence, um, which has meant that we can kind of use watermax with more certainty um, throughout our um, kind of analysis. Um, so why, why did we make watermasks routine um, and sort of add to, to that to that ARD? Um, sort of by by adding a water mask to every single product, um, it's because they are they are commonly used across many of our products, um, and having these pre-processed reduces the processing time and kind of prevents or or makes it less common that we run into um, kind of processing issues. Um, so that's something which. Um, so, so it, it's something something which really helps us along um, and and keeps keeps everything running quickly. Um, so as well as these kind of for every individual image, we're also doing it for, for annual aggregations. So it's quite common that um, we found the users want to to run one of our kind of products for um, a single a year. So if they can 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 take that that annual water mask, um, then then that kind of again reduces that processing time. And similar concept for the for the geomedians. Um, we've produced these. Um, sorry, I've realised that the, the text on the bottom left is is actually uh, not correct. That's that's the water mask uh, text again. Um, I'll make sure that's changed for kind of the the recording. 
Um, but so the geomedium products we've we've done on, on an annual basis, and what this gives us is kind of a best cloud-free composite um, of um, sort of the obstacle data sets. So we've done this for Sentinel Two and, and for Landsat Eight. Is their kind of our, our fullest um, data sets? Um, um, what it is is kind of like a median function but it's it's done on all bands kind of at the same time so to, to remove the likelihood of cloud in the, in the best way possible and get the best kind of spectral representation um, across each of those bands um, so that's something which which took quite a lot of, of processing power to do those for each of the three countries um, for, for every year since 2013 um, and sort of certainly kept our, our, our DevOps team entertained for a while. Um, so just here, kind of touching on access again, um, I, I've explained most of this, this already actually. So on the left here, we have kind of this Jupyter Lab instance, um, it's kind of a, a sandbox environment, similarly to how many of the other um, data cubes are kind of accessed, where um, we've got a, a, sort of a set number of scripts which can, can be ran um and they can also be changed etc um currently this this sort of data cube system isn't completely open source um it's it's currently designed to be for, for users within within these the, the government ministries of, of fiji vanuatu and solomon islands as well as um users within university of south pacific um but this this could be subject to change um in in the future um but for, for those users they can can go in and access this jupyter lab instance um and run many products um, or this 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 shows our kind of Esri solution um, for Fiji where you can see the um, where you can see um, how you can, can kind of order these products um, via a, a form um, so the parameters in, in both sides are the same um, in that you you put in param you put in the parameters that you want such as the area of interest you want the time range you want the resolution and and kind of the projection which are common across all of our products um, as as well as sort of ones which are more bespoke to, to each of the products which I'm going to show you the products in a minute I realize I haven't really mentioned those those so much yet. Um, one thing which <laughs> has been quite the, the bugbear um, for us in this project is is, is the anti meridian, um, which which crosses Fiji, as you can kind of see represented within within this um, this geomedian here. I think this is was an attempt at making a geomedian for 2019, where um, you see we we get data gaps along this anti meridian. Um, we had quite a few issues with with missing data issues when when displaying in certain predictions um, especially global ones such as um, EPSG 4326 which any kind of geospatial people on the call will not not be uh, surprised about this but trying to get the open data cube technology um, to kind of kind of work with this in a way which doesn't have too much missing data um, has been been a challenge particularly as the the idea of this this um, the way the system works enables a user to sort of select any area of interest. Well, if the area of interest sort of only partially crosses this anti and is only the side of the anti meridian or um, is too large of, over this area, then it quite often results in kind of missing data, such as we had a, a, a large square up here missing for a while, and quite a lot of these, these islands in the uh, southeast were missing for a while as well. Um, if you're interested in this, then one of our, our um, DevOps. Um, resources luigi who's um he's no longer at, at the catapult anymore but he, he did a lot of work work on this about a year and a half ago um and he's written most of it down in quite interesting blogs so if, if that sort of thing interests you then then um go and take a look there um so so these are some of some of the data cube products which um we are kind of su su supplied as kind of they're, they're almost demo apps in a way in that we're, we're hoping that, that the users will go and kind of create more more afterwards and these were based on kind of this um user-centered design approach um, of talking to those within within various ministries government ministries to to see which products would would be of most use to them um many of them are are, are similar to those those produced by by um, digital earth africa um and digital earth australia um, we've got ones around around vegetations, ones around water quality, ones around permanency of water. Um, all of these things, which which are important when we're looking at, at, at environmental factors such such as sea level rise, um, uh, which which are pertinent in in these small island nations. 
Um, so I think for for time, I'll I'll not dwell on these um, too much. Um, but if any of you have any kind of questions about specific products, then, then we can cover those cover those in the question session. Um, this kind of shows shows one nice example of our uh, um, uh, showing change between the year 2000 2010, going from kind of the greens being 2000 to, to the oranges being being 2019, um, and we sort of looked at this at this one area and saw there was a lot of a lot of change going on um, in this sort of estuary. And then um, we sort of spoke to our kind of in-country representatives about this. Um, so you can see this this box on the right shows where there's a lot of change going on. And the box on the bottom left, the sort of blue box, shows there's, there's not much change going on there at all. Um, and what had happened was there'd been dredging within this um, with, within the, this river here. Um, and a lot of the sand was being sort of deposited into, into this, this area um, here, which had sort of changed this, the local morphology of, of this um, estuary. And there's a lot of a lot of corals and, and things like that um, along this coastline. And so it just kind of is one extremely quick and, and brief example of, of, of how we anticipate this, this sort of data being used um, towards these kind of more environmental um, type um, the type applications of sort of evidencing how a decision has, has impacted or, or will impact kind of a, um, an ecosystem. Um, so kind of some very brief, brief reflections for me as an, an Earth observation scientist. So I came straight onto this project after I, I left university. Um, and the point at which I joined, we sort of had a, a working sandbox environment with sample data and not a huge amount, but enough that I could kind of start working on these on these products um, straight away. Um, and just the, the kind of the, the the power which is is in there and the ease which is in there of, of accessing these data sets um, comp compared to when it when sort of you need to go and do 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 work on on other projects elsewhere and sort of download a, a whole room of room of data um, so yeah for me the, the kind of open data cube and all of the other sort of um, software which which I've sort of briefly mentioned as well um, Really comes together in, in in a powerful way, and, and you can see that by how many data cubes are being being built all over the world, um, based off, off these open source kind of solutions. Um, so I think that was kind of a a, a brief um, brief reflections um, from me on on sort of the ease of access which data cubes provided. Um, so I suppose now we've got a couple of minutes for for any questions. I don't know how um, you want to do this, Tommy. Whether we're um, taking questions over chat or, or verbally or Um, I'm unable to hear you. I'm not sure if you're talking. Hear me? I can hear you now. Um, yeah, so we're ready to start with questions? Please. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at the audience and I'm looking at the chat. If there are questions for Sarah, Let me kick off. Uh, 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 first, I want to apologize for promoting you to PhD, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I do. Uh, it's uh, I do wish you to uh, engage in science. And related to that, uh, I would like to ask you. Uh, in your in your talk, you spoke a lot about technology and implementation. Um, mm -hmm. And are you facing uh, some specific uh, scientific challenges also in terms of uh, statistical methodology, spatial analysis methodology? How do you deal with the uncertainty? So, what are the top uh, top, uh, let's say, two scientific challenges? Um, so, I think that it's yeah, so it's a very good point. I've sort of focused on on technological implementation, but there there are sort of um, yeah, all of these questions around sort of if you were doing any one of the products which we've kind of um, provided the a kind of baseline that that you can run um you would w from a scientific standpoint yeah you would you you would certainly want to go go and validate those and kind of implement them and, and see see how to what level of accuracy they are um 
currently we don't there's there's been very limited kind of kind of ground data going into these and um and yeah sort of way of way of validating um we've sort of taken most of the products are based upon quite 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 standardized um earth observation techniques um and things such as such as ndvi and quite often the outputs aren't definitive they're kind of a a range um with with kind of a likelihood of of um or, or a confidence attached to them of how those outputs look um what we're sort of um what what the outputs are is kind of a and a sort of countrywide or, or regional wide um, initial assessment with the idea that that it would sort of highlight prob possible problem areas or, or areas of concern to to these ministries who could could then go and and um, sort of take a take a closer look. So it's kind of that that first step in that that analysis kind of chain, um, as well as providing sort of evidence looking looking backwards. Um, but, but sort of what. Yeah, as I sort of said towards the end there, what's been provided is is sort of these Earth observation products, um, and they're, they're sort of there in the same way as, as with with the other data cubes, as kind of almost as as um, demonst as demonstrators of of how you can get get these systems working, so that so that then more complex kind of um, machine learning with training data, etc. There's capacity for those to, to be built into to the to the final product more through that kind of ability to access Jupyter notebooks um, and we're especially um, we, we, conversations with with kind of University of the South Pacific uh, they're sort of looking to take on that that's kind of scientific ownerships of, of the products going forward um, within their kind of geospatial program. We have a one question from uh, from the online participant uh, if uh, uh, satellite applications catapult is also uh, processing data for offshore marine part of the islands so more like a marine applications um so the so, so yes we've we've a lot of the kind of um marine areas are are covered within the analysis ready data um and we did kind of take Bit of a look into what we could do with that and one of the products is, is water quality which is looking at the turbidity of the water kind of coming out of, of estuaries in particular um there's a lot of gis data which is is loaded within the same the same platform most of which has been provided by the government ministries so it's kind of a a one-stop shop um for data so all of the kind of the the marine protected areas and and the known areas of, of coral and that kind of thing are kind of um marked within um, as I've said, the, the sort of ability to, to produce new products is, is there within this, this Jupyter hub system. Sorry, the fire alarm's going off. I'm not sure if you can hear that. Um, within, so, so the ability to produce new products is there. The sort of um, the analysis ready data which has been produced is for land surface reflection, um, whereas you can do slightly different processing on data sets um, to adjust it more to marine applications. So that's kind of um, why we haven't gone into maybe some of the other marine applications. Um, but certainly there's the scope to, to kind of add chlorophyll A type indices in there um, okay. as well. I have two more questions for um, you. Just keep them short. Just please okay. keep them short for the sake okay. of time because we have to continue. Uh, one question yes. is uh, QGS. Uh, we didn't see QGS in your workflow or like uh, for the, especially for the, uh, from the user perspective. And then the second question is uh, people at Fiji, you know, they have a they're different education system than UK, obviously. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you, uh, how do you get these people to use the tools and develop things, uh, you know, independently? So two questions, QGS and capacity. Yes. So with with QGIS, um, we're so it's something which we've used kind of in the background as we've been developing to kind of check and, and validate products as we've been going and that kind of thing. Um, but the the two kind of GIS systems being used in country are a, a Terrier GIS and um, Esri GIS as as the platforms. Um, of course, the the users can can download and um, use the GI, the sort of outputs in in whichever GIS system they would they would like. Um, as I said, the, the list of kind of softwares wasn't exhaustive. And secondly, about the education system. Um, so many of the government ministries that we've been sort of um, talking with and that we've been training up have kind of data scientists or um, government, sorry, uh, technical users, as we call them, um, as well as those kind of policy users. So we've been doing separate trainings for both of those groups um, and the uh, 
so so there are people within the ministries who have sort of that that level of technical GIS knowledge, um, as well as we're hoping this connection with the University of South Pacific will um, enable them to bring the data cube into their teaching within their master's kind of GIS and, and satellite remote sensing programs. Um, and many of those people already go into with into go into these these government positions. So we're expecting kind of that location within the university of the data cube to to filter through into the ministries. Okay, thank you so much for your talk and for your time. We really appreciate it. We're very sorry we couldn't have you here in Wageningen, but we understand it, of course. Uh, but uh, maybe next time uh, we stay in touch and good luck with your work and uh, success uh, uh, with all the projects. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Uh, we continue with the next speaker. Uh, this is uh, Ben Greller. Uh, he's from the 52 North, and uh, we're super happy to hear him because he's the uh, he's a uh, research director at uh, 52 North. Uh, so, uh, how is it called? The uh, research chief research officer. Uh, and uh, I know Ben uh, already now almost 10 years, and uh, we organized some summer schools together. And and he has a actually math background. He's a mathematician, uh, so he's always nice guy to contact and uh, ask uh, to debug the math problems. And he's been uh, or developed. He developed also a really useful things in just uh, the the space time career in just that more or less. I think it's uh, Ben's work. Um, and uh, also he did a, a package on, on copulas, uh, which are very abstract, but uh, also uh, quite used. And uh, so he did a lot of contribution to the R and the open source. And we're so happy he's now a, a research uh, a lead at the 52 North, uh, which is a, a non-for-profit non uh, uh, company in Germany. So please, uh, I will just uh, start sharing the screen. Um, please, uh, Ben, just try to keep it to... Uh, 15 minutes and then five minutes plus questions. Can you see the screen? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you, John. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, should work now. So uh, welcome everyone. And let's just kind of jump into the slides. Uh, just kind of very quick uh, introduction of kind of uh, what 52 North is. Uh, so the long time the spatial information research company, uh, kind of non-profit private research organization in the field of geoinformatics. And our background, um, kind of how do we work? We work in kind of publicly and, and privately funded R&D projects and also provide professional services kind of to develop mostly open source solutions to different customers uh, to kind of solve their problems and what we're kind of keen on is fostering open science through open data and open source software so uh, also kind of supporting education in the field of geoinformatics and spatial statistics and we have a couple of shareholders which is kind of university of münster and the institute for geoinformatics in particular university of trent with the itc and uh, to companies, Conterra from Münster and uh, S3 from Redlands, you all know. Uh, I would like to shed some light on kind of research projects that we currently do. And one is the Mari Data Research Project, kind of the overall aim to kind of reduce the, the emissions of uh, cargo ships worldwide. And the aim is kind of to go there by kind of 10% cut down just by kind of improving uh, how the ships are operated and how the routing is done just based on kind of hydrodynamical optimizations. Uh, based by the idea if we can put in kind of much more environmental data and forecasts to kind of better plan the routes of the ships and also kind of decide how the ship should lay in the water and do some kind of uh, optimizations there. Um, it's a long list of, of partners on this project. It's uh, funded by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy in Germany. So uh, let's start a bit more deeper in it. So the challenge of Mari Data is kind of, kind of have a route going from Harbor A to Harbor B. And so I want to know which is the best way. Of course, you could start with the shortest path that we can travel, avoiding islands, of course, this doesn't work. Um, but of course, we can also kind of add some additional data that we have these days, basically from the Copernicus Marine Environmental Monitoring Service. Uh, we can add very detailed forecasts for the next up to kind of few weeks, uh, what's gonna be the sea state. So it's gonna be wind speed, wind directions, wave heights, wave directions, and all these obviously have an impact 
on the energy demand of the ship, but they also kind of set of constraints. So we have to meet the schedule, we have to be there on time. Uh, the ship has certain properties that has an influence kind of based how the hull is designed, also what kind of maximum speed the ship can go. And of course, we have some tidal impacts, some permanent currents and some temporal currents we have to take into account. Um, so kind of get a com complex system we have to optimize here. Uh, the major components that affect the energy demand of a ship, so the dimension and load of the ship, which kind of leads to displacement, and it kind of may lead to different draw than the bow in the rear, which kind of makes a difference. So changing this by kind of one meter uh, might kind of increase or reduce the energy demand by like 5% or something, which is kind of so substantial for a very kind of small change at no cost, more or less. Um, so that's kind of in summary the trim. We also have waves, currents, wind, water temperature, and salinity kind of has an impact as well, because it kind of depends how easily the ship may go through the water and also how deep it kind of uh, goes into the water. And what we see kind of here in the pictures, uh, kind of where the energy is used on a typical cargo ship. So it's more like 40% is going into the propulsion and uh, the entire kind of movement of the ship. And that's kind of the best part we can target here to reduce the energy demand. So we have a bunch of data demands, the data sources. Uh, so we have the marked trajectories of the ships. This kind of observed data on what was the engine load, what was the fuel consumption. Uh, we have set of vector data, kind of current position, ship states, uh, tabular data, which is like destination, charter orders, schedules we have to follow. Uh, we also have like raster data, the Earth's observation data, well, the CMAMS data, which is mainly the forecasts, uh, base maps, a lot electronic nautical charge to kind of find the right way, knowing where are kind of obstacles, where are kind of environmental protection zones we have to kind of uh, avoid by kind of planning our routes and a lot more. And we also have kind of a zoo of different uh, file types and APIs we would like to use and access to get data from different sources. So it's a very kind of mixed system with all kinds of file types, data types, and uh, APIs we'd like to, to use and to include here. What you currently have, and which kind of already helps a lot, uh, it's kind of a very simple uh, web interface, but just to get a unified data access. So we have different data providers providing us with wind speed, wave heights, and so forth. And kind of, we just have a unified data access right now. Uh, we can just kind of pick up the different, um, different variables we are interested in, and also can uh, kind of select them in different file formats, select temporal ranges, and to just get one file back with all the data in it. And this especially helps our research partners who work on the hydronomical optimization, because they can get real data and kind of what was the condition where the ship has been traveling uh, when they receive the data. What we also can do currently, so it's still in the first year, uh, we, can, we got some reported data from one of our partners in the project, and we can now kind of integrate this data into the data structure and also combine it with environmental data and also look at the uh, data that they provided us in terms of the maximum engine load. So these lines on the bottom are the different engine loads uh, during the journey of this ship here. And they typically have the main engine and auxiliary engines. So the ship on its own, a couple of components that have to kind of play well with each other. And we use this data, obviously, kind of to learn about how the energy demand develops through traveling through sea, and also kind of to train our models later on to kind of have better predictions of what the energy demand might be in the end. To do that, we use machine learning approaches. Uh, also, just kind of this uh, few routes we have from the partner, but we use the AIS system, which is kind of uh, well, every ship on sea has to kind of send the signal and send positions and sea state and different information. So if we combine this data with the environmental data we have seen, so salinity, wind speed, wave height, and so forth, and can kind of understand based on the machine learning model what drives the energy demand, energy demand of a ship and how well can we model it in the end. And just when we understand what drives the energy demand, we can also control uh, our machine learning optimization to find the best route with the lowest energy demand in the end. The immediate results we have, um, so we do this kind of estimation of speed over ground and course over ground. Uh, what the course over ground and speeds are kind of different from the heading and the true speed in water, of course. And that's what we can kind of estimate from the machine model quite well so far. And uh, what we can see, so if you have different environmental conditions, different weather conditions, we can see how the 
uh, ship slows down and quite a healthy um, well, energy demand would increase if you would try to have the same speed forward. Uh, but now we can see kind of what are the effects of these different variables. Next step then is to kind of use machine learning routing approaches to find the best way through the water from point harbor A to B. And it's by nature a multiple objective optimization problem. And so we try different algorithms here. So thinking about generalized adaptive A star, genetic approaches uh, that should kind of prove well. Uh, could also go up to reinforcement learning. Uh, so we kind of try to find the best route here through simulations and then kind of combine different routes, different simulations uh, to find the overall best route. And of course, with different criteria we have to look at the travel distance uh, with a certain velocity, this kind of time span can approximate the fuel consumption that we have had during the simulated routing uh, at this time point T and can just kind of, well, have to look at the ETA, the estimated time of arrival, a couple of safety constraints. Of course, you can't suggest a route for the ship to go uh, kind of the cargo is at risk or the ship entirely is at risk because the weather is kind of too heavy. So the additional constraints we have to follow and well, different actions we can take during the simulation would be kind of change the heading, speed up, slow down, obviously. Uh, could also tolerate a delay, a waiting time, uh, because if you're not in time uh, at the harbor, you either have to wait, which costs money, or you have to kind of pay extra because you're being late, or you might even kind of lose your slot at all. Um, so it's kind of pretty expensive, of course, because you can't sell the goods you have on board. Plus this, we of course need also analysis ready data. Um, we kind of briefly seen in the talk before. Um, so the definition isn't pretty clear from here at least. Uh, what evidence ready data actually is. So it really depends on the use case and depends on the modeler and what kind of, uh, kind of how affine the modeler is to do some extra steps or not. Uh, obviously, we don't want to start with the raw data and have to kind of make this data ready for our use case. And then uh, the Murray Data Project, these kind of use cases are we would like to provide environmental data for the routing applications. So we have kind of space cross time corridors along trajectories that you would like to uh, efficiently extract from our data cube and provide to the machine learning infrastructure kind of to find the best route within this corridor along space time. So kind of thinking of, well, so tubes in a space time creep. Um, we think about reducing environmental data through hydrodynamic models. So the hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic team, uh, they provide models kind of how the impact, the energy demand on the ship uh, looks if you have kind of different input parameters and we could just kind of re to reduce the amount of data we have to send to the ship to do the optimization on board. We could reduce the dimension already in the data cube, providing these models on top of the data cube and then just kind of sending the estimated energy demand toward the ship and the ship can then just find the best route through this uh, space-time corridor. And of course, we have to directly integrate the entire processing with Python machine learning. Uh, in, in processing workflows. So there's uh, no sense kind of sending the data around. We have to make it kind of in close to the data. Um, so we explore different solutions. We look into GeoNode and uh, kind of try how cloud ready it is for our purpose. Uh, so combining the three data, S3 data stores, uh, which didn't work out so well in the first place, but kind of uh, could be improved and uh, was kind of sufficient solution in the end. So what's very really nice about GeoNode is consequent use of interoperable interfaces. So it makes it very easy to extend and, and to enlarge an entire ecosystem. And it's based on established open source software, obviously. And uh, while well, it's not yet cloud native by uh, well, how it's kind of available right now, but there are kind of certain additions you can make. And uh, what we're lacking here is kind of the native processing environment. And we also tried the open data cube. Uh, which worked well for a set of products. Um, so we have the unified access kind of to different data sources combined in the data cube, uh, especially for, for GeoTIFFs, uh, we used it. And this works pretty well. And uh, so we also provided uh, a kind of PyGeo API provider for the open data cube uh, to make it easier to integrate the entire system and uh, inserted GeoTIFF data, uh, digital elevation data, and so forth for, well, different projects, not uh, the marine project here in the first place. We use a cloud deployment, which kind of works pretty well. And now we have kind of the APIs, OGC APIs, coverages, records, and processes, which are available for Geo API here. So what's uh, kind of nice to have the Nethers ready data in place in the open data cube, 
It's entirely Python-based, so it's technically pretty easy to integrate it with the uh, Python-based AI approaches. And I uh, would like to, in the future work, extend adopt it to metadata management and uh, also further evaluate the cloud technologies, saying F3 cloud automatic GeoTIFF. Um, just quickly, the architecture of our Maridata system that we currently have, so kind of a bunch of data sets at the bottom, a geo node layer more or less in between, feed it by PyGeo API and Geo server, uh, providing different OGC APIs and custom APIs to the geo portal uh, that we provide to the Maridata users, the routing application, and also to the decision support system, which is going to be the system running on board of the ship to guide the crew to find the best route uh, from harbor A to B. Uh, second project I briefly want to mention just two slides is kind of very related because it helped us also to kind of define this entire data infrastructure, research data infrastructure. It's a KISSA project and uh, kind of the idea here is the motivation is to bridge the gap between domain knowledge and infrastructure. So we have many metal loss kind of very uh, keen on doing machine learning algorithms, but they kind of don't know how to get the data in. Uh, probably not in this room, but kind of a larger audience and a kind of set of partners from, from universities and research institutes uh, in Germany and we're kind of working on different uh, sets of applications. And in the kind of framework of the TISA project, we're going to also host the next year's Open Geo Summer School, uh, hopefully mostly in, in, in person, but most likely also as a hybrid event, at least in some sessions. Um, the challenge of the KISSA project is also access across different data providers. So every uh, application has different data sources. Um, and also we'd like to support different analytical infrastructures. So being able to use it locally, being able to be in the cloud, but also on a high performance computing cluster. Uh, in Yuli here in especially, and with different fields of applications, what you see on the right hand side. Uh, so we have like cloud prediction, snow and ice prediction, water quality and, and water resources up to rainfall, uh, which goes into uh, vegetational aspects, so kind of health of plants, and goes kind of all together in the atmosphere. Uh, so we kind of look at all these five different use cases, and we're going to want to build in the end is also the e-learning platform to make it easier for practitioners, uh, also to kind of people new to, to AI and machine learning in the field of geo applications to make it easier for them to kind of use these tools there. In summary, um, what we learned is kind of we need to move towards kind of integrated research data infrastructure. So it's not just spatial data. We also have to kind of get in more data and different data resources and also provide help kind of along the entire research process. So not just having data here, but we're also kind of by finding data, acquiring data, uh, pre-processing data up to kind of versioning of data and models. So that's something kind of we learned from these two projects here. Uh, the typical processing patterns we'd like to uh, support. We think that standardization will help us kind of make the system easier to adopt to other use cases and to make it easier standard. Um, we're looking forward to a cloud-like deployment, uh, but have in mind that it's going to be most likely federated systems, so different data sources in different places. Uh, but should kind of to the user, to the front end user, it should kind of just behave like a one place system with a single unified interface, uh, no matter whether the data is in the background. And we will build on existing frameworks, GeoNode, NetaCube, NetCDF formats. And uh, well, next on the agenda is kind of to further look into stack and cloud optimized geotiffs. And uh, the deployment so far is cloud based, but it's not really native cloud based scaling. So there's a bit more work to do. Thank you. That's it for my side. Any questions for Ben? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so regarding the do you need to set up a similar environment to this for the parameters during the first test? Uh, yeah, you will have kind of it's more like um, where you have to model the ocean to really make this reinforcement learning work, and then we'll have kind of simulations how to go from A to B and what are the different constraints during the uh, well during the ship route. So how will the waves and temperatures of water and so forth change? And this is going to be uh, well a whole load of uh, 
computational effort that you're going to make. So it's continuously recomputing them. Yeah. Real time. Real time. So the, the ships aren't kind of connected online all the time, or at least not at a kind of uh, large bandwidth. So we have to kind of update it like every three to six hour blocks or something. Also, the new data isn't kind of coming so quickly. Uh, so we have to kind of little time window we, we can use to kind of process the data. I hope not, but let's see. One, one question. So, uh, yeah, uh, I have a question. Um, what is the advantage of using all the data sheets? Well, the advantage is kind of you get an. I mean, you, you can use it or not. <laughs> um, well, with Joe's experience so far, it's easier kind of to integrate different data sources and different data sets. So uh, it's not just a single set in the end, and you get it to the unified interface on top. But of course, there are different solutions to it. So you can pick kind of, well, we, uh, what's still outstanding is kind of different performance measures. So which kind of solution works best in our case? And especially um, the challenge that we see is kind of this space time cube around the trajectory to extract this uh, really quickly and fast because that's going to be the, the standard request on the data cube so i'm here i'm going to go there what is the space time conditions along this route and uh, this you no know, we didn't with the different ideas to make it kind of in, in chunks of cubes or in kind of slices along the road and uh, the different options and we still have to check which kind of which one works better okay thank you so thank you then Thank you. And, uh, we're looking forward to the remember next time we will open GR uh, together with the KISS project and we can come on. We still have to see whether we should pick up our location or we're going to be hybrid. But anyway, the exact time again. Thank you, Ben. I'm happy to announce the next presenter, which I don't have to specially introduce. I think so. I will talk. Uh, I will talk about building a um, a global multi-scale data cube. Um, so let me share the, the screen. Yes. So yes, I'll uh, talk about uh, uh, some work we did, uh, especially Landra and me, um, preparing a global data and doing some modeling. Um, we have this uh, uh, project, actually, that's how the first project we started called Open Land Map. Um, and it's our flagship, really, uh, flagship system for global data, global solutions. Uh, it's been inspired by OpenStreetMap, but we don't have at the moment people digitizing or doing anything like that. But uh, we are focusing on uh, hosting and uh, um, making available environmental data. Uh, and also, we would like to establish uh, open development communities. We have uh, quite some data sets. We have uh, land cover, soil, climate, land degradation. Um, and we have uh, different resolutions up to 100 meter globally. Um, and recently, I think when people ask me like Open Land, what do you really want to achieve with it? And uh, so in, a, in a one sentence, what Open Land Map would like to become is uh, uh, environmental history of the planet. Um, and we're planning uh, to do some upgrades in 2021 and it will continue. Uh, but uh, so we are adding more layers and making it more um, more um, up to date with the uh, uh, new data layers. Um, this is the land cover map that um, uh, it's on the S3 uh, um, Living Atlas, uh, published recently, I think maybe two months ago. Um, it's a 10 meter resolution global land cover map. There was quite some discussion. This one of my favorite, uh, you can follow on Twitter. Um, Matt, Matt Husudan, um, uh, he wrote uh, quite some, he did quite some uh, testing and analysis. Um, and, um, and so there's quite some discussion about that. Um, but I'm just mentioning it. I mean, I don't want to get into that product now. 
I'm just mentioning that uh, and something I ask also Martin Harold that we have this paradox today that uh, we have a better and better remote sensing and you know we, you can map the world at 10 meter and possibly somebody who's good in programming you could do it in Google Earth Engine you know some student master student um, but uh, what the paradox is actually that it's way more interesting uh, what is happening in the past. So uh, for me, you know, like looking at the land cover today, okay, it's interesting, but uh, any, any application we do, we notice that it's actually way more interesting, you know, what was on some pixel, what was it there like, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. That's this environmental history. And, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, basically. I want to talk about that, how to fill that gap um, in the data availability. Uh, so one of the global uh, like uh, data cubes uh, a project uh, in Germany uh, called uh, uh, Earth System Data Lab. Uh, so they build this what they call Earth in a box. Um, so it's like a you know all the all possible biophysical grids uh, going from you know uh, carbon uh, CO2 uh, um, emissions uh, to um, climatic variables, temperatures, uh, vegetation, etc. And so it's a, it's kind of complete data cube. It's uh, ready for analysis. There's also viewer. Um, so it looks all great, but it is uh, uh, I think 25 kilometer, and it covers only I think last 20 years. So uh, very coarse resolution only 20 years. Um, when you look in the US, they, there's this uh, neo. Uh, NASA's Earth observation, um, it, also similar, it's a similar to this one, so it's data kind of stacked, you know, to same um, uh, grid definition, um, and uh, also a lot of data, it's primarily based on MODIS, um, and also covers only uh, from 2000 to 2021 now up to date, and also when you look at some layers, you will see that you, you miss a bit of Canada and Russia, so there's also gaps. Um, so, uh, so we looked at all that and we said, uh, yeah, there is the, this paradox that uh, yeah, actually we need better, we need better data going backwards. Um, and also it's important when you think about it, why do you need to have a good models of past? Because how do you predict future? It's future is to uh, build models to understand what happens in the last you know, 30, 40 years. If you build models that you, uh, you know, you can explain things, then you can apply that models to the future. But otherwise it's difficult to predict future without understanding the past. Um, and also when you look at lots of things like land degradation and, um, uh, you know, you have uh, um, all these different soil degradation, land degradation processes. So really to understand them, uh, what caused them, and sometimes they are, they are multi-factor, so there's a multiple things cause some process, and to understand which which component is most important and how do they work, the only way to do that is to do some uh, modeling through time. Uh, so when you look at before 2000, you know 2000 was a big year. I think uh, the GPS uh, became public and more this project started, and uh, so there was a big year. And from 2000, we have a lot of data up to 100 meter, I think. 250 or 100 meter globally public data. Um, but if you go be beyond 2000, there's less and less data. And then if you go beyond 1984, I think that's the pre Landsat, you have very little global data based on Earth observation. Uh, then from be be beyond 1984, basically you do detective work, you just have pieces. So it's like reconstructing a scene with a, you know, somebody dropped a piece of hair or something. So it becomes like a detective work. So we, I did the inventory and uh, this is all the data I find that is uh, a special temporal published and available. So public data sets. Um, so there's the AV uh, that go uh, all the way to 1980s. And so there's the AVHRR, uh, there's a, a daily and monthly NDVI uh, at five kilometer. Uh, then there's the uh, recently published uh, Hilda Plus. Uh, this is actually the most detailed a data layer I could find on uh, based on uh, uh, Earth observation that has a uh, land cover time series. It even goes back to 1960. Uh, then there's another similar product, uh, but at five kilometer um, glass GLC 
there's also night light images. They're available also up to 1980s, I think. Um, then I think the, mo the data set that spans the, the furthest back in the past, even up to time of Jesus Christ and things, um, is the Hyde 3.2. Uh, so that's a land use uh, time series. It's a 10 kilometer. And then there's a vegetation continuous fields, and uh, terra climate. Uh, also five kilometer monthly goes all the way back to 1980s also. Um, this is an example of the nighttime light data. So there's been a lot of work also to fill in the gaps and reconstruct for the past years. But you see it goes, I said from 1980s, but it's the, actually from 1992. That's the furthest you can go with uh, uh, finding the nightlight images. Um, and this one is this uh, um, the VCF, so um, vegetation continuous fields. Uh, also really uh, well prepared and but it misses it has uh, it's a five kilometer also uh, but it misses uh, northern uh, hemisphere a bit so it needs to be gap filled um, then uh, so what Landry did we uh, we looked at the AVHRR and the MODIS and we started uh, gap filling and um, uh, producing a, a date trying to produce a monthly data set uh, which has basically no missing pixels and no artifacts uh, and the noise is minimized. And so we are producing these data sets now and we, uh, Landra actually made that uh, at 250 meter from 2000, 2020. And also we have the five kilometer. Uh, so maybe I can show you that. Um, so if I go to open land map, so if I, if I go to open, let me just start from scratch. I can go to the, the place where we are now. So we are here. Uh, let me zoom out a bit. So as, as a default, what you see in open land map is the land cover data. And uh, you can go back, there's this uh, 300 meter product. So we can go back to 1992. Um, this is the European Space Agency CCI uh, land cover project. Um, and so that's very nice that they made this uh, data set and they updated it. So it goes up to 2018. Uh, so you can see changes around Wageningen. And you see in Netherlands, usually there's a urban growth. There is also the, the uh, 100 meter resolution uh, data set, uh, which is, as I said, this is great 100 meter resolution globally available, but uh, it's only 2015, 2019. It's a base on the proba, I think, uh, primarily. And you can see much, much less. I mean, I literally have to zoom in. I have to zoom into Wageningen and uh, to be able to do some changes in within a few years. So that's the 100 meter global. Uh, then you have the uh, HILDA data set. So we're very happy that we, we managed to integrate in uh, open land map all these land cover data sets. And the HILDA data sets, you, you can go up to 1960, but it's a one kilometer. So you have to zoom out and you have to, in order to see the big picture, you have to zoom out and you have to play that. So, so these are this uh, data set. Of course, it's much more drastic if I go somewhere to uh, Brazil. Um, so if I go here, then uh, it's much more drastic. Let me zoom out. Um, then you see much, much more drastic change, especially when you go through uh, to the past. And uh, so, so when you when you now visualize this hill, I mean, then you you get you get an idea of the scale of um, you know the uh, land transformation in in tropics and in countries like Brazil and Indonesia. Um, so that's the that's the Hilda data set. And it's very nice. It's um, actually group, Martin Harrell's group, they made this data set, so we're very happy. And now we are, we are based on this hill that we can go and uh, remake all these other layers, downscale them to one kilometer. And we would like to make a you know, data cube, um, which is a one kilometer. Um, so, but at the moment, what we have, it's the, the NDVI, we have a 10% and 90% monthly quantiles, so the high and low NDVI. Um, and we also get filled the terra clean uh, and downscaled height to five kilometer. And we uh, derived the cumulative values for the uh, frac vegetation cover fraction and, and for height. Uh, height has a, a probability per land use. Uh, so we, we, you know, we did a lot of processing and um, I actually, I made all this uh, gap filling and processing and then 
uh, resampled everything exactly to five kilometer grid. And eventually it's a five kilometer grid. One image is like one megabyte whole world. But uh, when you have a time series data, monthly data, and it goes all, to, all the way to 1982, um, so it looks like uh, on the end it was about 80 gigabyte. So it's actually become slowly grows. Um, and if we will do the uh, one kilometer, it will be so it will be 25 times bigger. So you are almost uh, close to I don't know half terabyte. Uh, so that's uh, that's what we would like to do. And so that now you have this data, and we prepared it as a cloud open if We put it on the we organize it so it's all stacked. You know. Uh, you can do space-time overlay. And so here's a data set, a point data set I prepared, a global soil point data set. It has uh, soil chemical and physical measurements, different depths. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's available on GitHub. And so I prepared this data set and then I do a space-time overlay. And now I build a model. Um, I focus on chemical soil properties. And so I have some static covariates. They only change with the latitude to longitude. Then I have accumulation, accumulation parameters. So this is how long has a pixel been under some land use system or how long has pixel been under forest cover. So how many years? Um, then you have the, so this accumulation, then you have a, a, a deposition uh, variable. So that, that will be uh, an opposite from the, so like a, a deposition will be, um, um, you know, if you accumulate the rainfall or something like that. And then you have the uh, CL is the past climate. So we take the climate for soils. I mean, it's not interesting what is the climate in the year when you do an observation, but for soil, it's a, it's a soil forming factor. So you want to know what is the climate last five, 10 years. So we can do this uh, uh, moving window. So we have a monthly teraclim, but we run a moving window and we estimate what was the climate, what is the rainfall in average last 10 years up to that moment. So we have this past climate. Uh, so we, we made that model and, um, uh, and so we prepared all this, uh, even like a, we have a, a cumulative rural population density. So it's kind of a pressure on soil. Um, and we prepared all this moving, moving uh, window averages. Um, and so we have also covariates that represent sudden change in land cover, which usually changes soil properties, et cetera. And we did a space time overlay and bingo, it's a good model. Um, so we can we can model pH in space time, and as you see, the the main co the main most important variable seems to be a tree cover. Uh, soils, uh, forest soils are more acidic usually, uh, so it seems to be the tree cover. So as you as you lose the tree cover, the pH of the soil changes. Then we have the Hilda plus also very good. Uh, this uh, forest uh, again mask. And then we have a precipitation. Um, and these are the usually the April and February um, and October and December. Uh, so so these, are the, these are the variables. And interestingly, also the land use, so rangeland, uh, whether you switch to rangeland and how long you, you have up. So the F, F uh, CUM, it means uh, accumulated, accumulated uh, fraction of rangeland. So how many years multiplied by the fraction? Uh, so they come as the best covariate. Here's the predictions. So there's the soil pH, 1984, uh, 2018. If you, if I switch very quickly, you see it's actually soil pH is relatively stable. There's no big changes. Um, so you have to zoom in somewhere. So let's let's zoom in. This is the um, I think uh, um, Nebraska. Um, so North Montana, uh, North Dakota. Uh, so uh, so if you zoom in here, you can see. Uh, yes, there is a, uh, uh, what happened with the pH is that uh, it's uh, more more acidic looks like. So the pH used to be higher and now it's less. So there seems to be a change. So so basically, yes, it's a proof of concept. It, uh, if you build up this space time data, you can then model soil vegetation uh, and you can try to ex explain maybe some land degradation processes. Um, so to come to conclusions, um, so yes, yeah, special temporal modeling is possible. And if you're interested in, in how exactly I did it, we have this tutorial on our GitLab page. We have a tutorial doing a, a special temporal ensemble machine learning. Uh, so how you to do a space time overlay, et cetera. So all explained. Um, and there is, I think there is enough monthly annual data um, at one kilometer, up to one kilometer resolution to go up to 1982 to have a consistent data set. I think it's possible to do that modeling. 
Um, and we would like to build, uh, go beyond this uh, Earth System Science uh, Lab and uh, beyond the uh, NEO, we would like to make a, a proper Earth System Science complete consistent analysis ready data cube uh, that covers this area. And we would like to make it available through open land map and to allow the groups to do modeling analysis. Um, it is it is way more uh, it's way more challenging, you know, doing space time just doing spatial analysis, space time analysis. Uh, it's way more challenging. Just to give you an idea, it, my estimate is it's about ten to fifty times more effort. To if you just say, for example, NDVI or land cover, you know, it's you can make a land cover for one year. When you want to make a time series land cover, it's a way more effort to figure out how to process it, uh, gap fill, etc. And it is uh, really challenging to go beyond beyond 2000. Do you say beyond or before before 2000? Uh, so as you go to years before 2000, it becomes more and more challenge, and it becomes more and more um, a challenge to uh, gap fill and to really um, um, convince people that they have the best data. And then to go below beyond 1980 at the moment for me, it's really it's a really detective work because it's like very, it's almost now no global earth observation uh, products. Um, so that's my conclusions and I'm open to questions. Uh, if you have questions, so if people online maybe have some question, I'll be happy to answer before we go for coffee break. There's the microphone. Yes, Landro has a question or comment. Yeah, you did talk about the depth in European and in my talk I also explain how we did this depth in. So, but it, I would like to uh, about this. How would you create this trade off between, for example, produce like a animal? Um, aggregated product, like for example, mm -hmm. in the or whatever, really, but without any type of gap filling and really produce like more and recurring products, like with higher and better resolution for the gap filling. Because actually, when we are doing this gap filling and I'm also I'm doing it, actually, we are interpolating and creating like some kind of artificial value. Uh, but then there are some. Um, how how you see the uh, how the between that view and have a better problem in the kind of in terms of central resolution or not that two was produced like in or I I think in the gap feeling so so there are two things um um uh, I think the and what I was teaching also in my course uh, the time series data has multiple components. And usually two components like uh, are the the trend, so the something systematic. Um, and I think this this thing you should definitely get try to get fill. Um, and because you know if it's very systematic, let's say ninety percent of signal is just a systematic variation, like a global temperature or something, you know. Uh, then you should definitely gap fill because you know you are you're better off. I mean, it's better to have values because you're ninety percent of signal. You know that it's systematic. Um, but sometimes you have this chaotic part, um, and this chaotic part is tricky. Uh, if you if you gap fill it, you you will assume there's a, you know that you understand, but it's chaotic, so you know you cannot model chaos. I mean, you can simulate it, um, so there it's tricky. But so I would my answer would be for variables that you know that the the uh, this systematic component is uh, large. I would recommend gap filling, and for the variables like uh, you know even like a rainfall, you know rainfall. A daily rainfall is very chaotic. Um, uh, monthly rainfall, it's not. Uh, monthly becomes uh, systematic. If you visualize, we have that actually in the in the open land map. So if you visualize the the rainfall for the world, uh, you can notice that it's uh, it's actually very systematic, uh, going from uh, month to month. So this doesn't change. When there's a bit of climate change effect, uh, but it doesn't change. So let me just show you that one, uh, so everybody sees. So here's the climate, uh, and we look at the rainfall. So, so that's the rainfall. And as I scroll through the, let's say, look at whole world, 
as I scroll through different months, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of related to the rotation of Earth and change of seasons. And yeah, so it's actually very systematic monthly, but the daily is very chaotic, you know? So if you go and get, feel the daily rainfall, uh, it's really tricky. I mean, unless you have neighboring days, you know, but if you don't have like eight days, and would you would would I go and get feel the if I don't have like a eight days and then I get feel rainfall probably I wouldn't recommend it, but monthly rainfall I, if you say well I need to get feel I would just say it's quite systematic, so for most places you know um, it's reoccurring, uh, so so that's my answer. There's a question Zoom, uh, let me read it. Um, what would be the compromise to go earlier than 1980? A question by Nick Hem. Uh, maybe coarser resolution space and time or fewer variables. Yeah, it's difficult. I, uh, I, really, I really want to say that to go um, before 1980, it's really detective work. Uh, to do the same thing like we do post-1980, to move back, it's you just have pieces of information. I mean, it's uh, it's on the edge of science fiction. So, uh, but uh, somebody might come, but you know, like Hyde, for example. Well, Hyde is a maybe good example uh, because they reconstructed land use up to the, uh, as I said, the uh, Jesus Christ time. You know, we we measure the time from Jesus Christ and things. So. Uh, so, so they managed to reconstruct. So high data set goes all the way back 2000 years. So how did they do that? I mean, they don't have any retroservation data. So um, I, I, I read the paper a bit. So they, they do some downscaling and they use some historic data. And, you know, there, there's lots of historic data, right? You know, you have a lot of records of uh, what, what was in some province or some geographical region. So not pixels, but uh, larger polygons. And that's how I think that's how they did it. But uh, how do you validate this data? How do you do validate, you know? Uh, we have like some uh, climatic measurements, meteorological measurements, I, I 150 years back, but we don't have beyond that. So how do you validate, you know? Uh, you know, you have to do these ice cores and stuff for, for ten, global temperature and things. So you have to measure uh, some places, but uh, you don't know in London, let's say, you don't have measurements of daily measurements of temperature or something um, going beyond 150 years. So it becomes a bit detective work. Uh, with this thing, I would like to close. I'm sorry, it took a bit longer time. Um, uh, with this thing, I would like to close. Please come back. We continue at uh, uh, 1040. Uh, we will have uh, also a couple of uh, super interesting talks. So please join us. We have, first we start, we kick off with uh, Raymond Slaughter giving a keynote. Uh, and after that, uh, Patrick Schratz, um, and uh, then we have a discussion panel and then we will uh, stop for the lunch break. So please join us at uh, 1040.